Hello everybody, welcome to our sound for video session. Just uh, checking in here, make sure sound is all okay, okay here. And whoops, let's go ahead and mute that. <laughs> uh, intro music here was brought to us by Carrie Judd and a band called TVAC, which stands for The Vacationist. You can actually check that out on YouTube if you go just search for TVAC, T-V-A-C. Um, that particular track is called Elegance and Entropy, so thanks Carrie for that. Um, just double checking here before we get started and get too far in. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Sound is good? Video is good? If you could just pop into the comments and reactions there. No comments yet. I will go ahead and let's uh, jump into a couple of things. So had a really great time at NAB. Carrie and I got to go out and uh, meet with a couple of different companies and I think You've probably, some of you have seen at least some of those videos where we talked about some of the new products. Um, one of them is, of course, the Rode Wireless Go. And Photo Joseph, good to see you. <laughs> good to meet you again as well. So we, we've got, we're working on the uh, review for this one right now as we speak. So I've got a couple of those kits. And uh, so far it's working out quite nicely. So we'll uh, probably have that sometime in the Saturday or Sunday time range. Uh, for the final review on that. Looking forward to that. We had some questions that were submitted ahead of time, so I wanna go ahead and jump to those first and then we'll come back and um, talk to everybody here. So let me just kind of cue this up. And here we go. We're gonna go ahead and do the keynote and play. Okay, here we go. All right, first question was from Zasha. And Zasha is asking about the Rode Wireless Go, which we actually just uh, talked about for just a sec second here. Um, two wireless go questions. What is the sound quality like and how do the gain settings work? I.e. is there only the gain adjustment of minus or zero minus six minus twelve? If so, how do you deal with loud or soft talent? Let me ask let's answer that one first. Um, the first thing to know on that is that it only has an output setting. It does not have an input setting. So that's going to be something I'll be testing here. I'm my concern is that yes, you can still clip this. Um, that is to say, if the sound gets too loud, it will distort. Um, regardless of what you set the output level to, but that is yet to be tested. I don't think there's any sort of, at least no analog limiters in here, probably not a digital limiter either, but I don't know yet, so haven't done the uh, that test yet. But yes, the output level, they actually changed it. So originally it was going to be zero, minus six, and minus 12. And um, I actually had to talk to Ryan Burke about this and um, he contacted me right after NAB or actually it might've been when we were still there. And he said, you know what? We're doing a firmware update. We're changing that. It will now be zero minus 12 and minus 24 because we're finding that some of the cameras out there have really hot inputs like the Panasonic uh, GH series of cameras. So that is an awesome change that they made really, really quickly. So you will be able to use this quite effectively with a lot of the really popular cameras out there. And what we're finding over time is that these camera manufacturers are making much better audio inputs. And I'm really proud of Panasonic for doing that. They actually have created what I think is a really usable microphone and on the GH5S, uh, even a line level input. So that's really nice. So that's how that works so far. And we'll have more in the review for you on that, Zasha. Then a question for the review later. I'm thinking of clipping one of these onto a talent in informal situations. I do audio, not video recording. How well does the built-in mic deal with talent misbehaving? That is fidgeting and moving around. Does it give you options that a wired lav might not? Well, it, of course it does give you the option of going ahead and just kind of putting this on your talent or just having them hold it or just putting it near them. So you do have a variety of options there um, and it's fairly inobtrusive so or unobtrusive. And so they could just hold it um, and that's another option as well. Yes, if they do move around, it will, like any other lavalier microphone, it will pick up some of the sound of the movement of their clothing and things of that nature. So there is still some risk there, but again, you do have a few other options as well. And again, depending on the person, most most people are not gonna be animated enough to really kind of mess up the audio, but if you do get some movement, you will definitely pick that up. So if, there's, if it's, if it's um, aggressive enough, I guess I should say. So thanks very much, Sasha, for that question. Next on to Hildo's question. Now that you're back from Vegas, what do you recommend as a lapel transmitter receiver over the 2.4, I assume gigahertz frequency is what you're talking about here, Sennheiser, XSWD, I assume, Rode Wireless Go, or still sold on the Rode Link system? And can you recap the pro and con of a system like this 
compared to the new Deity multi-channel. Okay, yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. So for those of you that haven't seen it, I did post a review of the Deity Connect wireless system just recently. And um, overall, I think it's a very good system. And um, I, I have a little story to tell, I guess. <laughs> um, in my review, I was, I was, um, I basically said that it's a little on the noisy side, and I think that was a fair assessment, and I think a lot of people agreed with that just based on the audio that was in the video. But some people were concerned that, hey, it sounds noisier, um, that it sounds noisier in my review than it did in some other reviews. And so that got me thinking, and I, I got in touch with Andrew over at Deity and said, hey, what's going on? Um, I'm getting what seems like an awful lot of noise, self-noise in the recordings with the Deity Connect. And so between the two of us, um, you know, I kind of told him how I was doing my recordings and what my setup was and so on and so forth. He did some additional testing and they actually found, um, I guess what could be considered a little bit of a bug. So on the output settings, you can choose a couple of different things. You can choose record, which means you're going into a recorder, or you can choose DSLR, which means you're going into a camera with a 3.5 millimeter input, basically. And so I actually had it set to recorder, but I was going into my camera. So first of all, my fault for not catching that and changing that setting. But what they found was that the amount of self-noise coming out of the receiver when you're set to the record setting was actually a, a fair bit higher, uh, more prominent than if you had it set to the DSLR mode. So they've actually made, and believe it or not, I couldn't, I was surprised by this, but they were able to make a firmware update that just went out today. So if you go to the Deity site, you can get the the firmware update if you have a connect system and uh, that actually is supposed to address that issue now i haven't had a chance to test it extensively yet i just got the, the word from andrew a couple of hours ago so that's really cool from the standpoint that they're really they're, they're listening they're listening to their customer base they're listening to the um, you know reasonable criticisms of their products and they're making changes so that's really really good so that was a little bit of a detour let's get back to the question so um here you're asking Sennheiser uh, XSWD, which I reviewed a couple of months ago, Rode Wireless Go, which we're working on the review now. Um, previously, I've been a user of the Rode Link wireless system, and then there's the Deity multi-channel. So all of these systems, just so you're aware, all transmit over the 2.4 gigahertz frequency range, and all of them do what is variously called adaptive frequency hopping, so that they you don't have to set up a frequency they choose the frequency within the 2.4 gigahertz range um, and hop around and do whatever they need to do to try and do their best to stay connected. So um, so anyway, so that is the first thing I wanted to say. So they're actually all similar in that way. Um, they're all using slightly different algorithms to do that. I know, for example, the Rode Wireless Go, as far as its specifications are concerned, doesn't have as large of a range as some of the others, but um, according to Rode, they've done a lot to optimize the algorithm it uses to hop around to really do its best to deal with lots of interference. If there's a lot of Wi-Fi around, um, or if you're out on a convention floor where there's a lot of other RF around, it's supposed to do a little bit better in those circumstances if you're within, you know, a relatively short range. And in fact, when we did our, our interview with Ryan Burke of Rode at NAB, uh, we got really good results. We didn't have a single dropout. In fact, I had recorded, we recorded um, Kerry was operating camera, so we recorded the Rode Link, or sorry, the Rode Wireless Go that Ryan was wearing. Uh, we put the receiver on the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera, and uh, we thought, okay, we'll put that there <laughs> as a test, and then I'll also record separately with my kind of interview stick mic and a Sound Devices 633. Well, in the final piece, we found, well, the, the Rode Wireless Go did perfectly. It didn't have any dropouts, so we'll just use that audio. So even though I'm holding a microphone there, the audio that you're hearing is all from the wireless go system so it did really surprisingly well now would it work if you are 25 meters away 30 meters away 50 meters away i don't know in those circumstances that'd be tough but again if your use case is going to be relatively close range then this could be a really good option for you so um in any case uh which of those would i choose well i um let me just say this so far and again this is called kind of temporary until I finish the other the reviews. The Sennheiser XSWD I really liked from a, from the standpoint that it's very simple to use. There's no there are no settings. You basically turn it on and you go. The problem with it is especially if you are recording into cameras like the GH5 um, or GH4 that has a relatively hot 
microphone input that if you do anything more than talk into that microphone, you run a pretty serious risk of clipping and distorting. You could get an attenuation cable to run between the receiver and the camera, and that could solve that problem, um, but that's a little bit of a pain. Um, and that's just because the Lumix, you can only turn the input gain down so far on it. So that's one consideration with the Sennheiser. Um, I did talk to some other people that were using the Sennheiser on the show floor, the XSWD, and it did pretty well if you were close range, but it did cut out a fair bit. You did get some, you did get some cases where there were drop, you know, very short dropouts and things of that nature. And again, this is all very close range. The Wireless Go, as I mentioned before, did very well for us in the particular part of the show floor that we were on. So that was that was really good. Um, some people don't like the fact that it has inbuilt batteries, and that's the same with the XSWD. And in fact, with the Deity, if um, Anyway, that's a consideration. So every individual needs to choose for themselves whether that's a problem for them or not. Um, so that's a consideration. The Roadlink system, of course, is a is a kind of tested and tried system that works quite nicely. Um, from my standpoint, one of the, its advantages are you can control the input level, you can control the output level, and you can also um, replace the batteries. So you can put in rechargeable batteries and, um, and you can also power up via USB if you need to do that as well. So that's okay. It, uh, it uses the, um, the micro USB inputs. So it's a little bit dated from that standpoint, but again, overall, it's a very good system. It has a good range. Um, sounds good from my point of view. So it's a really good option. The Deity of course is a multi-channel. So you can have two, you have the kit comes with two transmitters and a single dual channel receiver. So that gives you a lot more flexibility, and as soon as you start needing to record two people, then your options are either to go with something like the Deity, where it has a single dual-channel receiver, or you'll have to buy two kits of each of the other systems. So, And then you'll have two receivers that you'll have to kind of wrangle with. And if you're trying to record that into directly into camera, for example, you'll have to have some sort of cable that can feed both of the, the feeds into the camera itself. So... There's some upsides and downsides. Deity actually also said, and this is actually breaking news since my review, I talked with Andrew, and actually he had an interview on um, over at Gotham Sound. They have a YouTube channel as well. And one of the questions he got there was, well, what, is that battery user replaceable? And his answer was yes. You can actually remove um, six screws on either the transmitter or receiver units, and you slide the aluminum casing off, and then there's a battery terminal. You disconnect that, you pull the battery, and they would have to send you a new battery, but it is it is potentially replaceable. So that is something to keep in mind as well. They haven't talked about what the pricing looks like on that or anything yet, but uh, for those that have that concern, that is something to consider. All right, so um, Hildo, I, don't, I, I think based on all that information, hopefully that will help you make a better decision. I think the, the nice thing about the Deity is you can control the input and the output levels, same with the road link. On the Deity, you have even more options. So really, of all those four, the Deity has the most control, and the Sennheiser has the least control. Um, the Rode allows you to control the output level only. Sennheiser, you control nothing. Rode Link, you can control both in and out. So um, Rode Link, of course, has the downside of the receiver and the transmitters are kind of large-ish. So they're a little bit more difficult to hide if you're doing narrative work where you don't want to see the transmitter on the talent. So that's, an, that's a consideration as well. Um, I think its range is going to be a little bit longer than the Sennheiser or Rode, at least l longer than the Rode Go, Wireless Go. Um, so that's a consideration. And um, so hopefully with that information, that'll help you make a decision of what's going to fit best for you. If I could, you know, if I had to choose one, uh, see, again, I don't know exactly what you're shooting, but I would say in terms of ease of setup, they're all pretty straightforward. I think the Deity has the most settings but that also gives you the most flexibility. So it's a trade-off. Um, of course, the Sennheiser is easiest, but you could run into trouble if your talent gets really loud or if you're doing you know, some sort of narrative piece where people are going to be yelling or even a vlog or something like that. So anyways, uh, that's something to consider as well. Let's move on to the next question. Next question is from Remco. My colleague and I use a Resolve um, plus RX-7 Advanced for our entire post-production workflow. We are now looking into some affordable automated fader solutions. The PreSonus products are looking really interesting, but I've heard that the protocols in Resolve don't allow for good integration. I don't know really what, what to expect. Do you have any insights you can share or perhaps an alternative product you recommend? Well, um, I think that's a good question. I have used the, the PreSonus, the single channel, and I was able to get it to work. Not all the buttons work, but 
overall, I thought it was pretty decent. Um, for me, the biggest, the most important thing was being able to have that fader um, to do some automation, just to kind of simplify that process rather than using, you know, a keyboard and mouse to, or a mouse, I guess, basically, to do the automation. Um, and I got it, I got it working. Um, so it was okay. I've also got um, an Allen and Heath SQ5. So this is a really big digital mixer with can't remember how many faders it has, a whole bunch. <laughs> I've gotten that working as well, but that was a job. It's always a job to get these working because they're basically using MIDI to communicate with the host software, in this case, Resolve. Um, so those are the only two I've used. Again, got got them both working. Um, and again, for me, the most important thing was the fader, and I got those working, so that was okay. Um, but if you're expecting all of the buttons to work and do all the things they say they can do, potentially with different um, software, Unfortunately, that's not the case with either of those two, but um, I think probably what I would recommend is I would try out the the PreSonus and just see how you go with that. Buy it from someplace you can return it if it doesn't work out, and uh, that'd probably be my best advice I could give you on that front. So thanks for that question. Next up from Paul, your opinions please on the new Zoom audio interface that requires no gain settings. Is this a game changer? This is the Zoom F6 I believe you're talking about. Um, it, it, is it a game changer? Well, I haven't used it yet. It, it was under glass. I couldn't use it at NAB, but it looks really, really exciting and interesting. This is, by the way, the Zoom F6 is not the first device to implement a sim, this type of thing. This has actually existed in some other things as well. Um, other kind of high-end audio gear as well, having the dual um, analog to digital converters. Although I think the 32-bit recording is... Uh, maybe that's also available in some other things as well, but um, that, I think that's kind of, that's that's part of the whole equation, the dual analog to digital converters plus 32-bit. In short, yes, I do think it's a game changer. However, I haven't tried it yet. Nobody's tried it yet <laughs> out in the public, so we don't really know how that translates. If it's applying Unity Gain on its input, its microphone inputs, which it is, um, is what Samuel told us, my concern is that there could be a point at which that could still clip, but I don't, I don't know. It depends, um, and so that's what we're looking forward to testing a little bit. But yeah, Paul, I think it definitely could be a game changer, and I'm excited to get my hands on one of these in the next uh, month or two here. So stand by for updates on that. Next question from Jeffrey. Always look forward to the Q and A sessions. If you've covered this before, I apologize for recording ambient sounds like city streets or crowd noise. Is a shotgun still the best option? I know close mic sounds like a babbling brook or squeaky hinge that a shotgun is the way to go, but I haven't tried yet for these types of sounds. I currently use the Rode NTG3, and I was considering the NT4 for stereo effects of these large ambient sounds too. Have you used stereo mics? I know the 5-pin XLR is tricky. Can I use that with the Mix Pre 3? Okay, series of questions there. So you can go either direction, and it really depends on what you're looking for. If you want a stereo ambiance, then a stereo mic is a really good option, and I think the NT4 is a good option there as well. Um, the NTG3 the, or any other shotgun mic, the advantage of that is that you can isolate and get just the sound that you're trying to record. So you can use that for a crowd. Um, you can use that for um, even city streets if you want to isolate what it is on the city street that you're trying to capture and maybe reject some of the things you're not trying to capture. So I think really, ideally, you'd get both of them I mean, you'd have both of them at your disposal and make that decision on the spot. Um, but of course, a, you know, like a stereo mic is going to give you a little bit more s spatial information right there. You're going to get that stereophonic effect right in the recording, and that can be valuable as well. It's going to be less work in post potentially, um, but you may not have as much isolation capability. All right, uh, and then the 5-pin XLR, all that means is you'll have a 5-pin XLR output that, so you'll have a cable that actually splits that 5-pin XLR output into two standard XLR 3-pin, um, and then you'll plug those into two different channels on your Mix Pre. So that's how that'll work. So it's not really tricky, it's just, it's relatively short. You'll have to run a couple of cables or an adapter cable there, um, and then potentially two cables if you need an extension to get to your Mix Pre. So. Hope that helps, Jeffrey. Thanks for the question. And then the last question I believe here is from Ali. After processing the audio, doing your compression and EQ, etc., does it affect its quality if I apply the phase option on Isotope RX? Um, Ali, if you're using the uh, adaptive phase rotation option, then my experience is no, it doesn't affect the audio quality. It just, again, it kind of 
optimizes the overall waveform to give you the most possible headroom. So I haven't found it affecting the audio quality or changing the timbre of the sound in any way, just kind of rotating the phase so that you get the best or the most amount of over um, headroom, I should say. So hopefully that answers what you were looking for. Okay, let's head on back here to the main camera. All right, we have a bunch of questions here, it looks like, and so I'm gonna start, start at the top here. Uh, Joseph Floyd still just popping in to say, I'm hoping for a video on a two boom mic interview setup. I've used, I've seen LinkedIn Learning has been using two CMITs, not my price range. Um, okay, I appreciate that. That's a, I think that'd be a good topic to cover. So I'll put that on the list. Thanks for that, Joseph. Um, again, do you still use, uh, still have your Zoom F4? Have you updated to the late, the newest 3.0 firmware? Any thoughts on how the 3.0 update extends the usability of F4. Yeah, I have updated it and it adds the adaptive um, hybrid limiter or the look ahead limiter. So that works nicely, just like it does on the F8 and the F8N. Um, and you also get, I believe you get the new, I think the headphone, the digital amplification is on that one as well. So that's good if you're working with headphones that need a little bit more push to them. Um, so overall, I think it's a, worth, a worthwhile upgrade. I have not experienced any issues with it yet. If anyone else has, please let us know. But it's been pretty solid for me. So yeah, I definitely have my F4 still. And I am still working on that F4 court case. It's a uh, course. It's been put on hold because of all the other things that have come along, including NAB. <laughs> um, but I, have, I definitely still have it in the pipeline. And it's just a matter of getting enough time to work through it. All right, Joe Choi, what's an affordable way to interface connect studio monitors to a PC. I need it for audio processing for video work, thanks. And then there was kind of a back and forth there between uh, Gan and Joe about having an audio interface. Let me just say this. Um, I actually have a set of monitors from JBL on the way that don't require an audio interface. You can actually plug them directly into most computers with a 3.5 millimeter headphone output. Um, and they are powered. Um, so we'll see how those go. Those, those, those will be pretty affordable. If I'm not mistaken, they're less than $200. You don't need an audio interface. They have a volume control on them. JBL is known for creating monitors. This is nothing new for them. They've been in the business for a good long time. So um, we'll take a look at those here in the next probably month or two. So hopefully that'll that'll be helpful for you there. Mark Owens, any chance showing the Tentacle Sync for Windows app on a Windows machine? I know you're an Apple user. I contacted Tentacle Sync, got reply was that they do not have tutorials or manual for the Windows version. Um, okay, um, I'll see what I can do, Mark. The problem is, is sourcing a, a Windows machine. Actually, that's not that much of a problem. That That's fairly doable. The problem is, is I'll need to look into screen recording apps to, to support that as well. Basically, all the Windows app does is it takes, and it's only useful in cases where you have, when you're using time code with a camera that does not have a dedicated time code input. So you've recorded time code instead to one of its microphone inputs. And all it does is it takes that uh, time code, which has been recorded to an audio input and converts it into metadata time code, outputs the video clip files, and you have to do all of them. And then you can take that into your um, into your nonlinear editing app, whatever that may be, Premiere, Resolve, whatever, Final Cut. Uh, well, actually not Final Cut if you're on Windows. So um, then you can actually just say, okay, sync the video to the audio clips and they'll be all synced up. So. That's all that does there. So um, I'll see what I can do there. No promises, but I'll I'll put on the list and give it a try. All right, Art Johnson, hi. Hi, Art. <laughs> um, Alejandro, thanks for helping me out, responding to my emails, the pleasure's mine. Uh, Alejandro, if you don't mind, I'm gonna share um, kind of at least in high level terms what you were asking about. Um, there is a, there's a challenge and I think we all see it as we work as, production sound people on crews. And that is a lot of times directors and camera people don't understand how to record high quality sound because that's not their focus. And that's, that's totally fine. Totally understand that. That's why you have crews with specialized members. Um, some, you know, somebody that can focus on sound, somebody else is focusing on the, the camera and somebody else is focusing on other things. So, um, one of the questions was he got some feedback from a director that he worked with saying basically the the sound isn't loud enough and it sounds flat. So, <laughs> um, and this is a common thing that you run into, especially the it's not loud enough thing. And and 
kind of the assumption that I typically make is that, you know, they just don't know. A lot of these people, if, especially if you're working for kind of less experienced directors, they just don't know that you need to leave plenty of headroom so that you don't clip because in the end, you're going to do a mix and the mix will make it all loud enough, but you can also carefully do your compression or whatever you need to do to optimize the overall quality of the sound um, in the final mix. But a lot of them don't realize that. And in fact, I worked on a short film this weekend and it was with one of my friends who I've worked with before. He's a, He was a DP. And then we have another guy who was acting as a director. And when we went to kind of do our, our meeting the, a couple days later, um, and I was showing them how to use Tentacle Sync to, you know, the Sync Studio to get everything synced up. This is their first time using Timecode. We went through all that. We got the um, the XML exported, brought it into Final Cut, and we were kind of scrubbing through it. And they were going, oh, man, the sound is just not loud enough. And I was like, don't worry, guys. <laughs> this is, there's a reason for this. And so it really is a, it's a delicate uh, situation because you have to have the confidence of the director um, to be able to, to kind of start to educate them on how things can work. now, and, and it can be tricky on those situations where the director is also the editor and they don't know a lot about sound mixing. So for them, it's just like, ah, the sound's not loud enough. I don't like this. I want the sound to be loud enough directly. You know, when the, when the mixer or the, the sound guy gives me the video or the audio clips, I just want to be able to drop them in my video, edit and publish, and I'm and you're good to go. And unfortunately, that's not generally how it works. Um, you can run it a little hotter you can run the risk of doing some clipping depending on which recorder you're using you can turn the limiter on and it will do its work um, but it, that's a that's one of those cases where you have to kind of develop the relationship over time and, and gently say you know for example yes I can do the sound louder this time but what you need to understand is we're taking on the risk and this is the risk we're taking on if we do that we're taking on the risk that a will clip and it will distort and it will not sound good and there's not a lot of good ways to fix that or what we can do is have you know I can, give you the audio clips a, a day later. So after the shoot, I'll go home, I'll loudness normalize it by doing some compression and kind of optimizing the audio and then deliver it to you and it will be louder. And we'll get kind of a, those benefits of leaving plenty of headroom and not distorting and clipping and also give you audio that you feel like is probably closer to what you want in terms of overall loudness. So it just, it's, a, it's one of those processes where you have to kind of develop that relationship and help them you know, gain their trust and be able to advise them on the best ways to do this and what's involved in the process. So those are some thoughts there. So it was a really great question, and I appreciate that. Um, Art is waiting for the course on the Zoom F4. Yes, I am waiting to <laughs> figure out how to carve out enough time to finish it up. It's about halfway done, um, and so it's hopefully coming soon. All right. What one is, what one earth did you mute? Sorry about that. I'm not sure I understand that. I may have been about the music. Keith Owen, hello from Utah. What is your best guess on the price of the new Zoom F6? My best guess is, I'd say eight hundred dollars. Between six hundred and eight hundred, but probably closer to eight hundred is my best guess. All right, hello from South Florida to. I am D.A. Brown. Thanks for joining us today. The Wormhole Productions Group. That is Carrie Judd. I'm just going to go ahead and reveal that here right now. <laughs> is Carrie your stunt double or do you have your own, do your own stunts? Uh, depends. For production sound, I do my own stunts. If I need music at the start of my videos, Carrie is my stunt double. Wow, hello from Malaysia. And I think you say your name Therek? I hope I didn't say that incorrectly. Uh, Joseph had to leave. Thanks for joining, Joseph. Throwing light. The sound engineer mixer on set is responsible for time code because you can't know all cameras. Who is actually responsible for setting time code on the actual camera? Thanks. Appreciate your videos. That is a great question, throwing light. I've, I've actually found that typically I have to do some education there as well. So this last weekend when we did the shoot, this was the first time that this DP used time code. And um, I had to basically walk him through how to set it up. I, I was very careful about asking him, is it okay if I, here's what we need to do. Just explained it first. And then, um, you know, was careful to ask him, are you okay if I, this is, you know, do you want me to do it or do you want me to walk you through it? And he said, actually, you can, you can do it. So I actually showed him how to set it up. And that works. I think that's the thing. You just have to be very respectful. The camera is their tool. Don't just go, you know, don't just, you know, elbow them out of the way and start setting things up. You just need to respect them, 
and the fact that they own that camera or they're, you know, they're, they're the owner, I should say in air quotes, of the camera. And, um, you know, just work with them the best you can. Okay. What microphone is that? This is the Shure SM7B. And Alejandro responded to the question about time code and who sets it up on the camera. Uh, throwing light often was told that it's our job. However, there are those that say camera department. I say it's not a bad uh, to learn a new skill. So yeah, I think I would just check with them and just make sure. Um, it, you know, basically when you take the time code generator over to them and you as a sound person, you generally supply the time code generator um, unless some other arrangement has been made. But yes, it's the, it's the mixer that provides that. And just ask them, are you good to set this up? Would you like any help? Um, and just so be respectful of them on that. All right, Pradeep says, thanks for answering Hildo's question. That was, that gave him more clarity. Cool. The Wormhole Productions Group, which again is Carrie Judd, in case you weren't sure, that SM7B is the Gucci. I think that means it's good. <laughs> Um, Banks Naughty Bits, Curtis Judd Audio, any word on new plugins for the Mix Pre line beyond the Music and Ambisonics plugins? Hoping for a compressor expander to bring live functions similar to a DBX-286 into the box. That's a great idea. I don't have any inside information on that, but I'm happy to pass that on to them next time I talk to them. I think that's a great idea. So you could basically have something that would be really good for live use, basically do real-time processing um, for spoken word live use. That'd be really cool. Steve George, welcome. He says he's late to the party, but party's not over yet. All right. Uh, Pradeep, going further with regards to the question on mix pre-recorders, will sound devices consider giving a mix assist feature at least on the mix pre 10T? If they do, I'll buy it right away. That's a good question. And I don't know if it's a limitation of the processor they're using in there. And I don't know if it's an FPGA or some other type of um, of unit in the mix pre, I don't know the answer to that question. Or if it's a decision, they're just not putting it there because they want to differentiate the different product lines. I don't know the answer to that, um, but I have mentioned that to sound devices before. I think that would be a really nice feature to have as well. Uh, let's see. Curtis, do you know a possible release date for the Deity VLOV Pro, the one that is the same size as the Cost 11? I think they said they were saying July. Um, we'll see. It's a new company. They're still getting their chops worked out in terms of delivering new products. And so they're usually pretty optimistic about when they can deliver them. <laughs> and um, I'm not, not trying to be critical there, but the reality is that it, <clears throat> it sometimes takes longer to get things to market than they thought. But they're, I think they're saying July for now. Okay. Uh, Greg Palmer, great question. On narrative set, going from two shot to single, do you stop swinging the boom mic between characters and only concentrate on the on-screen character? Um, that's a good question. I think, I think that depends, Greg. I'll tell you what I do and what I did this weekend. I continue to cue the boom pull between the two characters. And I and I definitely nowadays insist on having a copy of the script beforehand so I can get to know the lines well enough so that I can be better at cueing between the two characters and really capturing their lines. Um, sometimes directors will still say, well, go ahead and, and um, improvise too. So that's, that, that's where things get tougher. Um, but generally, I am still kind of cueing between the two people, although I could see there could be a case if you have a, a script and the director is really sticking to the script, that might be a case where you might not need to. You might, you could just, like if you're doing an old over the shoulder of one character um, of a one shot of the other person, then that could be a case where you might not need to, to keep swinging the boom. So interesting, interesting question. And I think a thought provoking one. I'm not sure the way I'm doing it is right or if there is a right way, but those are my thoughts there. I think on the smaller productions where things are less formal generally, I'm still generally going to cue, um, do my best there just because who knows what's going to happen in post. <laughs> All right. Michael Wynn says, hi, Greg, good question. That depends mostly on the distance of the two talents. If it can be played without affecting the on-camera dialogue coverage, it will work well. Good point. 
Gee whiz, 5150, love the channel. I'm working more on location sound as location sound recorders these days, and I'm always asked if I can supply comms as well. Have you had much experience with that area? Yes. Um, yes, definitely. I have. A, I do have a, two sets of comm techs, so I can supply two sets of headphones for people. So generally it'll be the director and maybe a producer. Um, sometimes a DP wants one, but I don't have a ton of experience because not a lot of really small productions necessarily expect that. Um, but yeah, I definitely have that kit and it definitely makes a difference. I think they're, they're usually very appreciative if you can offer that. And, um, just the nice thing about the Comtex, they're pretty easy to set up and there's not a lot. I mean, configuration is super simple and, you know, that's one you don't have to worry about quite as much because if they do cut out, it's an annoyance potentially, but it's not like a show stopper. It's not going to kill the, kill the show. So, oh. For Mr. Lucas Erler, and I probably didn't say that at all right because I don't really speak German, but greetings from Cologne, Germany. Good morning. Good morning to you. <laughs> uh, all right. And then hello from North Carolina from Aaron. Good to have you join us here. All right, Prady, thanks for the response. You bet. Sound speeds. Hey, Curtis, just wanted to pop in and say hello. It's great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. And if you haven't watched uh, the Sound Speeds channel on YouTube, I would definitely check it out if you are a soundie, which you probably are if you're listening to this. Um, lots of great content over there from our friends Sound Speeds. Uh, next up, Thomas Donalek, would you suggest the Deity D3 Pro for indoor interview recording? Something better to suggest in that $300 US range, Phantom Power XLR OK, recording into an H4, currently looking to upgrade from there. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, well, the nice thing about the D3 Pro is it actually does have a, an adapter that you can run a, a balanced uh, cable, which is nice. So that would definitely be an option. It, it sounds quite good to me. Um, it has a relatively forgiving polar pattern, so it's a good option from that standpoint as well. That means it's not quite as directional, but um, it that's an okay option. I do have a, an older video on the Curtis Judd channel that talks about five, it compares five different boom mics for indoor dialogue. If you just do a search for five boom microphones, indoor dialogue, Curtis Judge, it'll pull up. Um, you might take a look at some of those as well. And there's some options there in the, uh, there's, yeah, there's some options in the less than $300 range. So that's some things to consider. Uh, Soundspeed's also mentioned, Greg, as a pro boom op, I can tell you it depends. Depends on how close they are together. Are there overlaps, et cetera? And yeah, I think that's back to the booming question. And if you're doing a one shot versus a two shot, do you, do you continue to cue the boom pull back and forth um, when you go to the one shot? Um, so yeah, I think it really does depend on a lot of factors there. All right, and Pradeep, is this his first time catching this live from India? Well, glad you could join us here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, sound speeds, that's Alan, by the way. Uh, Michael Wynn says hello to Alan. Is your, well, there's a question here from Michael Wynn. Oh, sorry, Joe. Is your live stream audio processed? I will have to figure out streaming dialogue live pretty soon. Um, I'm just going through a mix pre. I have the mix pre 10T down here on the desk. I don't know if I want to risk lifting it up. There it is. <laughs> I don't want to pull any cables. Um, and that's routed into my Panasonic GH5S. That then goes from HDMI, feeding both the, the picture and audio. Um, into an AJA UTAP, uh, which is a little converter that converts it then to a USB feed into the computer. So that uh, that's how we're set up here today. No processing. So um, actually, there might be a high pass filter. Let's just check. Yep, low cuts to on at 80 hertz, and that is the only processing that we're doing here today. So great question. All right. Michael Wynn, Narrative Mixer and Boom Op here, just wrapped work, showing Curtis some love. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> and congrats on the wrap. That is good. It's always a good feeling. Alejandro, I just remembered I'm getting a set of used Comtex, the 72 series. How much different are they from the 216s? Ooh, that's a good question. I'm not that familiar with the older ones, so I don't really know uh, about that one. Perhaps some others can sound off about that one here. 
Uh, Greg Palmer, I'm wondering about the F6 dual AD converter setup. Will there be a trade-off? Preamps, um, perhaps a greater noise floor. Well, that's an interesting thing. And practical tests will give us the answer to that, of course. According to Samuel at Zoom, um, it shouldn't, again, because of the 32-bit recording and the dual AD converters. We'll see in practice. Um, it's a very intriguing idea, and I can't wait to try it out. So um, anyway, then, then over to Steve George. By the way, I'm in Aussie land, Canberra, just saying I, uh, just saying. By the way, I really get quite a bit from your channel. Very cool. Well, thanks very much, Steve, and thanks for joining us here today. Uh, Thomas, thanks. Am I right to think about a more shotgun style for indoor interview risks shotgun phase problem? Yeah, it certainly does. Anytime you have that interference tube on a shotgun mic, you can get that uh, phase issue. But again, I don't, there are plenty of pro sound mixers that are still using shotguns indoors. So keep that in mind. Um, but you have to be on top of that. And you have to, if you, if you find yourself in a particularly reverberant situation and you're finding that the talent is worming their way off of axis of the microphone, that's when you're at risk of getting into that situation. So again, it's not, it doesn't happen a whole lot. If they, if it's a seated interview, it's not going to happen a ton. Um, and especially if you're doing things to control the reverberation in that room, I found that it's generally not that big of an issue. So, and then we have Scott Vanderbilt, who is Scott, it's good to hear you um, from you. And Scott's also addressing Greg's original question about booming on a one shot back and forth between two talent. In my experience, boom ops should always focus on characters whose coverage is being shot. If you go off axis to cover the off screen talent and you miss an Im uh, important line, the main actor, that's a major screw up. Chances are that will be the editor's favorite take and you'll piss off the dialogue editor. Don't take chances in my humble opinion. It's fair, fair point. Um, Again, it, I, guess, it, I guess it depends on how, again, how things are being shot. Are, you, are they allowing the actors to improvise? That's where it's going to be a much riskier thing to do. And that's where I would probably, I'd probably agree with Scott there. You probably want to stick with the safe thing, which is just getting the coverage of the, of the actor that's on screen. And actually, I, I guess technically you're right. So if we're talking about a situation where one actor is on screen and the other is not, I would just let the, the actor off screen, let their love pick up their lines and just just boom, the, the the only actor that's on screen. I guess I'd agree with that. Um, in our case, we actually had a, um, it was an over the shoulder shot. So both actors were technically on screen, although you, don't, you weren't seeing this, the face of the person over whose shoulder we were shooting. So we still had the, um, you know, there was still, I still wanted to get the coverage on the boom and it was a fairly straightforward scene. They weren't doing a lot of improv, improv, so I was able to cue back and forth without a problem. It's just a, it's a calculated risk. All right, Alan again, sound speeds. The 72 series have crystals and you have to switch crystals to change frequencies. The 216 series can be switched. Okay, so that, that sounds like the 72 series, you're locked into a frequency on the 216. You can switch the frequencies by just using a little switch on the back of the units. So that's really helpful. Um, thank you for that, Alan. Bangs, uh, bangs again, where do you cut low cut for male and female by default if you're enabling that on the recorder? HVACs are coming on here and it's murder. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm typically going to be somewhere in the 60 to 80 range for both men and women. In most cases, you go a little more aggressive on for women generally. Um, so that's something to consider. All right. Um, we have some people. Pradeep, I'll be in your neighborhood in a few weeks. That's from the Wormhole Productions Group. Uh, Scott Vanderbilt, regarding context, 72 versus 216. I think the 72 megahertz brand, uh, band is no longer legally usable, at least in the United States, or maybe that's everywhere. I'm not sure, but... Not 100% certain, 216s are generally preferable. Uh, Alan from SoundSpeed. Scott, we protect on camera, but swing anyone else that won't sacrifice the on camera. We can also have our sound utility boom off camera, which is essential in cases of overlaps in ad libs. Yeah, cool. If you've got a utility there that can actually boom a second boom, that would be, that's probably ideal. 
Like when, if the actors are in very proximity, the edge of the mic can get the off-screen actor just fine. Bringing the loud into the mix can be messy. That, yeah, if you're delivering a mix, definitely, for sure. And, oh, there's a connection here. So Alan works with Michael Wynn on set. He's my boom op. Very good. <laughs> okay, small world. Okay, uh, very good. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap there. Thanks, everyone, for, for uh, all the questions and for joining us. It's probably pretty late in some places for some of you and uh, very early for others of you. So thanks again for everyone for joining. We'll do this again sometime soon. And take care, everybody. Talk soon.